Hey everyone, this lesson is on the Cori cycle and today we're going to talk about what the Cori cycle is, what it actually does, and then we're also going to talk about how it actually occurs. So to begin, cellular hypoxia and intensive exercise can lead to anaerobic metabolism in muscles and this anaerobic metabolism in the muscles can lead to the production of lactic acid. So if you're, you know, exercising a lot or if there's some other condition which causes hypoxia in the muscle tissue, it can lead to anaerobic metabolism and lactic acid production. This lactic acid production is formally known as lactic acid fermentation. So this is why the Cori cycle is important because if lactic acid is produced in the muscles, it can lead to decreased tissue pH levels. And the Cori cycle will actually process and remove the lactic acid to prevent muscles from becoming acidotic. And this prevents the muscles from experiencing a lactic acidosis. Now the Cori cycle not only helps to prevent acidosis in the muscles, but it can also recycle the lactate. Now the lactate is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism and the liver can actually take the lactate and convert it and process it to form glucose um, through the process of gluconeogenesis. So lactate in the muscles doesn't really help the muscle at all. It's just a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. But the Cori cycle can help to actually transport this lactate byproduct to the liver. And the liver can take the lactate, process it, and recycle it to form glucose, which the skeletal muscle will use for energy production. So how does this all occur? Well, during intensive exercise in the skeletal muscle, Glucose is by far one of the most important energy sources for the muscle. And glucose can come from the breakdown of glycogen through glycogenolysis or through the uptake through GLUT4 transporters. Now the muscle during intensive exercise needs a lot of energy in the form of ATP and it gets that energy by breaking down glucose through the process of glycolysis. And it actually leads to the production of pyruvate. Now, pyruvate is a three-carbon molecule. Glucose is a six-carbon molecule. So glycolysis actually leads to the production of two pyruvate. I only show one here, but it actually leads to the production of two pyruvate. Now, also in the process of glycolysis, the cell can acquire two ATP. And during the process, utilizing the enzyme glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, or GAPDH, NAD plus can be reduced to NADH so the cell can actually get two NADH molecules, one NADH produced for every pyruvate produced. So because there's two pyruvate produced from the glycolytic reaction, we actually get two NADH. And I don't show it here, but it's actually two NADH. Now when oxygen is present, pyruvate can enter the mitochondria and be processed through the tricarboxylic acid cycle to actually generate anywhere from 32 to 38 ATP. So in the presence of oxygen, the cell can acquire a lot of ATP. However, if there is no oxygen present, what happens? What does the muscle cell do? If the muscle cell is undergoing intensive exercise, it needs to keep generating ATP. And how does it do that? So when oxygen is absent, when the skeletal muscle cell is in an hypoxic condition, Pyruvate stays in the cytosol. It does not enter the mitochondria to undergo the TCA cycle. So because the pyruvate stays in the cytosol, it can be acted on by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH, producing lactic acid. And in producing lactic acid, proton or hydrogen ions are generated as well. Now, this process from pyruvate to lactic acid through the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme actually oxidizes NADH back to NAD+. And this entire reaction is known as anaerobic metabolism. And as we mentioned before, this is called lactic acid fermentation. Now, why does the muscle cell do this? Why does it do this when there is no oxygen present? And it's because when oxygen is not present, the pyruvate cannot undergo the TCA cycle. It cannot generate large amounts of ATP through the TCA cycle, which means that the only ATP that's generated is through the glycolysis pathway, that 2 ATP. So because glycolysis is the only pathway by which the skeletal muscle 
during hypoxic states can generate energy, it needs to make sure this pathway can keep operating during intensive exercise. So the muscle cell must ensure that it has the substrates required for the glycolysis pathway to continue. And those important substrates include glucose, and which can come from glycogenolysis or GLUT4, but it also requires something else, and that is NAD+. Now, NAD+, in the cytosol, is in limited quantities. And this is the main problem, because if NAD+, in the cytosol, is, has all been reduced to NADH, glycolysis cannot continue. There is no NAD+, for the GAP-DH reaction to occur. And that's why pyruvate is converted to lactate through the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme because the cell can regenerate the NAD+. So the NAD+, can be used for the GAP-DH reaction, and that can mean that the skeletal muscle can continue to perform glycolysis and continue to generate 2 ATP. So once lactate or lactic acid has been produced in the skeletal muscle cell, it has no more use. It is just a byproduct, and in fact, because it is an acid, it can actually cause problems in the skeletal muscle. And we've talked about that before. It can lead to lactic acidosis, and it can actually decrease the pH of the skeletal muscle cell. So the cell, the skeletal muscle cell, has to remove this lactic acid, has to somehow get rid of it. And how does it do that? Well, the skeletal muscle cell has a transporter on its membrane known as the monocarboxylate transporter 1 or MCT1. Now there are many MCT transporters, but this is the most important for lactate transport out of the skeletal muscle cell. So this transporter will actually transport the lactate out of the skeletal muscle cell and into the blood. Now this transporter is also proton linked, which means that the hydrogen ion produced from the hydrolysis of lactic acid can also be transported out of the skeletal muscle. So that means that through this transporter in removing lactate or lactic acid and the hydrogen ion produced, this can prevent the skeletal muscle from becoming acidotic. Now once the hydrogen ions have been dumped out of the skeletal muscle cell through the MCT1 transporter, the blood itself has a particular pH range of about 7.35 to 7.45. So because of that, the blood will actually buffer the hydrogen ions from the skeletal muscle. It will actually ensure that the blood itself will not become acidotic. But if there are so many hydrogen ions being produced and dumped into the blood and the blood pH itself does begin to drop, a reaction involving bicarbonate and the hydrogen ions can lead to carbonic acid production and eventually the production of CO2 in the blood and this CO2 in the blood can then be exhaled in the breath. So once the skeletal muscle has dealt with the hydrogen ions and has removed the lactate so it does not become acidotic, what happens to the lactate when it's out in the blood? Well, the liver or the liver hepatocytes also have the same transporter, monocarboxylate transporter 1 or MCT1. So that means that the lactate in the blood can actually then be transported through MCT1 and into a liver hepatocyte. So once the lactate is in the liver, it can be processed by the same enzyme, lactate dehydrogenase, to form pyruvate. And in this time, the NAD plus can actually be reduced to NADH. And this reaction goes in the opposite direction as opposed to the anaerobic skeletal muscle because the liver is not anaerobic and the liver has high enough NAD plus levels for the NAD plus to become reduced. So the high NAD plus will actually push this reaction toward the formation of pyruvate. And then the pyruvate can undergo the process of gluconeogenesis to form glucose. And again, this requires two pyruvate molecules to form one glucose as pyruvate is a three carbon molecule and glucose is a six carbon molecule. And as I mentioned before, Gluconeogenesis only occurs in the liver because the liver has glucose 6-phosphatase. Now, the entire process of gluconeogenesis actually costs the liver cell 6 ATP per glucose. So this is an expensive process, but it is worth it because this glucose can then be exported out into the blood and then be taken back up by a skeletal muscle to be used 
for glycolysis to generate more ATP for the muscle that's undergoing intensive exercise. So this entire process is known as the Cori cycle, involving the production of lactate in the skull of the muscle to the transport of the lactate to the liver, where the liver can recycle the lactate to form glucose, and then the glucose can be taken back up by the skeletal muscle. And this process is critically important so that the skeletal muscle does not become acidotic from too much lactic acid, and it also allows the lactate as a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism in the skeletal muscle. It allows that lactate to be taken up by the liver and recycled back into glucose for use by the skeletal muscle again as an energy source. So this can continue allowing the skeletal muscle during intensive exercise to keep generating ATP. Anyways guys, that was a quick lesson on the quarry cycle. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.